Our next talk stays in Europe and explores the production and transport segments of the hydrogen value chain as analyzed in a new study on imported fuels for long distance trucking here in Germany. Jan Serhusen is senior consultant for energy and hydrogen topics at the Ludwig Bölko Systemtechnik. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just remind you that you are very welcome to submit questions for all of the speakers uh, in the rest of the workshop. Please send them to us via the Q&A tab on our live stream. And Jan Serhusen, you have the floor. Thank you, Melinda, once again for the introduction. Hello, everybody, and uh, this time, good afternoon. Um, also here from my side, from our office uh, in Munich. It's a pleasure for me to talk to you about imported hydrogen fuels for long-distance trucking in Germany. And when I say hydrogen fuels in my presentation, I not only mean 70 megapascal gases fuel as it's already commercially available, for example, for uh, light duty vehicles and buses. No, I also then mean uh, liquid hydrogen fuel and cryocompressed fuels. And the abbreviations I will use uh, are LH2 for that and uh, CCH2 for the cryocompressed hydrogen. Now, if you're not familiar with the German national hydrogen strategy, you might wonder why the title of this presentation actually says imported hydrogen fuels. Well, there are actually uh, two very important aspects in the German national strategy when we talk about hydrogen uh, fuels today. Um, the German national strategy, who was, uh, which was um, published last year, um, first of all, has a very strong focus on green hydrogen, meaning hydrogen based on renewable electricity. Um, so that's very important to understand. And secondly, um, the German strategy has a strong focus on hydrogen imports. And that's just uh, due to the fact that it is expected that there will not be sufficient renewable uh, potentials in Germany to produce all the green hydrogen we need. So uh, as a consequence, we need to import rather large amounts of hydrogen in the future. Um, not only from uh, countries within the European Union, but most likely also from countries outside uh, the European Union. Having that, uh, this, um, we can go to the next slide to have a look at um, the content of my presentation today. So what topics uh, will I talk about? Well, uh, first of all, I will introduce a a possible ramp-up scenario for fuel cell trucks in Germany uh, for the two years uh, 2030 and 2035. Um, I will then uh, present the main elements of an import-based hydrogen fuel supply chain, and we will also have a look at the resulting hydrogen fuel costs. And when we discuss hydrogen fuel costs, we will also uh, take a a uh, more deeper look into the distribution part of those costs and how we can minimize them. Afterwards, um, there is another very important uh, aspect about the hydrogen fuels we will cover, and that's the related greenhouse gas emissions. At the end, we will wrap things up with some key messages, uh, which I picked up all the way uh, throughout the presentation today. We can move to the next slide, please. Before I go into details, I would like to give a brief overall overview uh, to the context in which um, those numbers and this study actually was produced. Last year, uh, the Daimler Truck AG presented their current fuel cell truck activities. And those include uh, the development um, of technical foundations for a 40 ton, metric ton long distance fuel cell truck, and that also includes the certification and the real-world testing of two vehicle prototypes. Now, there are a very uh, large number of fuel cell truck activities currently worldwide, uh, also in Europe and in Germany, but there's at least uh, one uh, very important uh, difference between the activities from Daimler and most of the other truck fuel cell activities right now. Daimler in those prototypes will use liquid hydrogen onboard storage to propel their truck. And that's, uh, I think, maybe not the, the only project worldwide, but one of very few ones. Now, as part of their in-house activities, development activities, uh, Daimler 
contracted a study, and that study should uh, take a look at a possible uh, ramp-up scenario for fuel cell trucks in Germany. And that study should also take a close look on the possible fuel supply chain from production all the way to the, to the nozzle, to the dispenser, and here analyze the resulting cost in greenhouse gas emission. And now that's when we come into play, our consortium. Um, that contract uh, went to a consortium of three companies, uh, one of them being uh, the company Prognos, uh, and that company took responsibility for the vehicle road rollout scenario and also uh, for the calculation of the overall fuel demand in Germany for those trucks. Um, then the company I work for, uh, Ludwig Berko System Technik, um, we were in charge of the supply chain analysis uh, with a focus on the economics. And last but not least, the third company um, was Sphera or is Sphera, uh, which had the overall coordination of the consortium and which took responsibility of the environmental analysis. And that's uh, the, the main uh, context in which uh, the study was uh, produced. And uh, I'm glad that I can present some of the results uh, today in, in this uh, workshop. Next slide, please. Now, before we uh, look onto the detailed numbers of those vehicles, um, we need to talk about the main drivers in Europe, why fuel cell drugs will come on the roads in the next few years. As you might know, in Europe, we have different uh, greenhouse gas emission targets for the, the road vehicle sector. There has been one for light duty vehicle for uh, quite a few years now. And then in the last year, or last two years, there's now also been a um, target for heavy duty vehicles. And that target says um, you have to achieve a emission reduction of minus 30% by 2030 uh, over the base year. And in this case, the base year is 2019. And the 30% uh, reduction relates to new vehicle sales, so new truck sales. Um, that's important to understand. For our um, scenario development, we also needed some target for 2035. However, for 2035, there is not an official target yet. So we defined uh, a greenhouse gas emission reduction of new sold vehicles uh, of at least 50% to develop our scenario. Um, then further, we assumed that um, within the European Union, um, Germany will be one of the few countries uh, who will overachieve the goals by 2030 and 2035. And that's just uh, to compensate for other countries which um, might have uh, yeah, fewer vehicle sales uh, in that time. Um, as mentioned before, the target is an average target over the entire European Union, so you can overachieve in one country and underachieve in another country, and that's, uh, that's allowed. In our scenario, of course, we also um, analyzed the impact of the battery truck deployment. Um, however, we assume that battery trucks will mainly be used for uh, driving applications with a daily driving distance below 400 kilometers and also for applications which do not have uh, space and weight uh, restrictions. So the, the European goal is not only achieved with fuel cell trucks, but with a mixture of fuel cell trucks and uh, battery trucks and in fact also with some improvement in the internal combustion engines of the conventional vehicles. So we have an overall scenario and now we will only have a look at the fuel cell part of that scenario. Now, what fuel cell trucks did we consider in our analysis? Well, we had a strong focus on uh, trucks in which uh, fuel cells make sense. So that's the heavy duty and long haul trucks. And in Europe, we call those the vector classes uh, five and nine. And vector classes, that's a European terminology which is also used for the emission calculation. Uh, you can look that up in the internet if you wish to. Um, but those two classes are actually the most relevant classes within the European Union, and they account for uh, a very high share of the overall trucking emission, and that's due to their high specific con consumption due to the weight and also to the high annual driving mileage of those uh, vehicle classes. Now, if we look on the left graphic, you see the uh, development of the vehicle stock of those fuel cell trucks in Germany. 
there will only be a few hundred um, trucks at first, prototypes and small demonstration projects uh, most likely. But then in 2030, we will already have 37,000 uh, trucks on the road in, in Germany, fuel cell trucks. Um, and that will ramp up quite quickly to 180,000 trucks by 2035. Now, there are two very important reasons for this uh, rather quick and steep ramp up uh, of the uh, vehicle numbers. The one reason is again related to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as the United States and other countries, um, Europe wants to be a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emitting by 2050. So if you want to have a 100% uh, uh, emission free uh, fleet on the road by that time, we need to start sale, uh, selling um, emission-free vehicles only about one decade ahead to be able to uh, replace all the, the, the old vehicles. And that means that by 2040, yes, we have to uh, bring the, the, the diesel with uh, fossil diesel fuel out of uh, our streets. And the second reason for this uh, quick ramp up is actually the fact that uh, vehicle manufacturers will most likely not be interested in producing multiple propulsion, propulsion systems in parallel. So, um, during that period, they might have to produce fuel cell trucks, um, battery trucks, uh, diesel trucks, trucks, maybe even natural gas trucks, and to uh, to reduce the, the the period in which they have to produce those four different propulsion system. Um, that's a very uh, important aspect also for those manufacturers. On the right-hand side, you see uh, a graphic an in, of an intermediate result we produced uh, in the in the project, and that's uh, the German. Uh, highway system uh, for 2030 and 2035. And uh, the colors indicate the number of fuel cell trucks per day you would expect on certain sections of this highway system. Um, the darker the color, the more um, trucks uh, you expect in that area. Uh, those numbers were used uh, in our study to estimate the, the, the quantity and the size uh, of the refueling stations, for example, but also to calculate the overall fuel demand. And that's what we will uh, have a look at uh, on the next slide, please. Now, based on this fuel cell truck rollout scenario, the calculated fuel demand just for those vehicle classes we consider is uh, 0.3 megatons of hydrogen in 2030, and that quite quickly five folds to 1.5 megatons by uh, 2035. Now it's uh, quite difficult to imagine how much 1.5 megatons of hydrogen are. So I've put down here some uh, numbers to, to give a good impression of that uh, large quantity of hydrogen fuel. You could produce 1.5 megatons uh, with 20 gigawatts of electrolysis at about 50% utilization. However, you could also import that with a large hydrogen pipeline with a capacity of about 10 gigawatts or by importing liquid hydrogen with a liquid hydrogen carrier, for example, from North Africa um, to Germany, and you would then need uh, six carriers. And that does not mean you need six loads of hydrogen. No, you need six carriers going permanently back and forth between North Africa and Germany uh, to import that uh, amount of green hydrogen. Otherwise, you could also use uh, 1.4 million truckloads of compressed gas, uh, but however, that's uh, quite not feasible. Now, if we move to the right-hand side, we see uh, the number for the uh, infrastructure. For this fuel amount, uh, we could use about 750 refueling stations with eight tons per day each. And out of those stations, about uh, 350 would be located located at the highway system. And uh, for comparison's sake, uh, that's round about very roughly the same amount of refueling station we currently have on the highway system in Germany. So it would enable a, a quite extensive network already. Um, 1.5 megatons would also save 5.6 billion liters of diesel and save uh, 15 megatons of uh, CO2 and, in addition, a uh, large quantity of other emissions uh, such as uh, NOx and, uh, yes. Um, currently, the overall fuel demand in Germany for industry and all applications is about 1.6 megatons. So we are very close in uh, doubling this demand 
uh, just with the fu with the fuel we need. And based on the national strategy, there is a pro projection for 2030, um, where it says, okay, around about three megatons of hydrogen will be needed in Germany. So by 2030, just about 10% of the overall demand could come from this uh, road vehicle sector. Now, on the next slide, you see an overview of the hydrogen fuel supply chains we considered in our study. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, Germany has a strong focus on green hydrogen imports, and there are a lot of discussions about importing hydrogen from Australia or from Chile or other countries. So we have uh, considered here quite a, a, a large number of, of countries and supply chains, because for some countries we did not only uh, look at pipeline, but also on LH2 imports or even liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Um, for today's presentation, I had to pick an example uh, we can look at because that's just too much to bring into this half hour. So our example for today will be the hydrogen export from Morocco to Germany. And we will look at two cases. The one case will be the, the pipeline import case via Spain and France to Germany. And the other uh, option will be the liquid hydrogen import we are, uh, we are shipping. Um, uh, to northern Germany. On the next slide, um, we will start uh, by looking at um, the most relevant supply, supply chain elements um, that would be required to enable such a supply chain for hydrogen fuels. On the left part of this slide, you have the facilities that need to be located at the export country. And on the right hand side, you have the facilities uh, located at the import country. We have shown in this graph uh, both uh, export import um, options. On the top, you see the, the option with the uh, export and import via LH2 shipping. And on the bottom, you see the, the pipeline case. Now, when we look at the at the supply chain in detail here. Um, we can start on the very left-hand side with the hydrogen production. Uh, for our analysis, we have defined a photovoltaic-based, uh, electrolysis-based uh, hydrogen production. And the produced hydrogen is um, fed to a liquefaction plan, at least uh, one part of this hydrogen stream. The other part of the hydrogen stream is fed to a uh, local storage for hydrogen. And that enables us to operate the liquefier uh, at a rather constant um, level. Uh, as you might know, um, processes like liquefaction are um, not very dynamically. So you cannot change loads too quickly and you don't want to turn it on and turn it off uh, frequently. So you need some hydrogen buffer in between to enable a, a more or less 24 seven operation of such a plant. Now then, of course, you would also need electricity to power that plant during the night and uh, morning and evening periods. And to enable this, we have foreseen in our analysis a, a plant based on concentrated uh, solar power. And that plant has a large um, solar or thermal uh, storage, and that enables electricity produ production from that thermal storage also during nighttime periods uh, to power the process. Now, after the liquefaction, the hydrogen is stored and then exported via ship to Germany, where it's uh, uh, stationary stored again for a short period of time before being trucked um, to the refueling stations. And then, um, depending on what hydrogen fuel you want to consider, you need, of course, different types of refueling stations. Um, for the case of LH2 hydrogen fuel, you need a more or less a rather simple hydrogen transfer pump from your local refueling station storage to the, to the truck. If you want to use cryocompressed uh, hydrogen fuel, you need a, a cryo pump um, for this hydrogen transfer. And if you want to dispense uh, 70 megapascal, you need a cryo pump and a evaporator to produce high pressure hydrogen gas. Now that's one option. The second option is um, 
hydrogen export via pipeline. Here we don't need an extra storage. We have assumed that you can uh, dimension this export pipeline that it is a storic intrinsically to outbalance um, the fl fluctuating hydrogen production. And then once the pipeline is in Germany, you have two options and which one you choose depends on the fuel you want to have at the end. You can either feed from this pipeline to a liquefaction plant. And now at this, uh, in this case, the liquefaction plant would be powered by electricity from the German grid. And then again, you have the distribution to the different refueling stations. Uh, the second option here is to uh, feed from the pipeline to a trailer filling facilities for gases, road transport, uh, for example, at 50 megapascal, which we have considered in our study to transport the hydrogen to the refueling station for 70 megapascal. Now on the next slide, we see the on the, on the figure, we see the overall resulting hydrogen fuel costs, and that's uh, costs considering uh, well to nozzle, so everything is included up until the, the nozzle of the ref refueling station. Um, and you see on the, the left two um, stack bars, that's for the LH2 shipping and uh, the different fuels, and the right two bars are for the pipeline case. And in this graphic and also in all the other graphics following on the slides, we have combined LH2 fuel and uh, CCH2 fuel into one stacked bar. And that's just due to the fact that after our analysis, we have seen that the cost and the emission differences between the LH2 and the CCH2 fuel are really minor. There might be a slight uh, cost premium for the CCH2, um, also in terms of emission, um, but it's really minor and it uh, does not make sense in, uh, in, in such a graphic to, to point that out. Um, so to make it more simple, we have combined those two fuels. And uh, if you look at the, the numbers here in this graphic, you can see quite easily that fuel costs of four to five uh, euro per kilogram are feasible for 70 megapascal fuel, but also for LH2 and CCH2 hydrogen fuels. Um, however, um, there is a certain cost advantage uh, here in this graphic for LH2 and CCH2 fuel, and that's indicated by those black downwards arrows. Um, if you compare those uh, stacked bars and the, uh, the, the colors of those bars, you see this difference mainly comes from the uh, light and dark green, and that's for the um, road distribution and the refueling station. And as you have seen on the slide before, um, we have assumed distribution with, uh, with a truck. Um, and now on the very right hand side, you see actually the impact uh, of the trucking distance on the overall fuel costs. Um, for our base case analysis, we have uh, assumed the average road transport distance of the fuel. And now on the right hand uh, graph, you see um, this uh, error indication. And this does not indicate an error, but a, a bandwidth of minimum and maximum distribution. Um, so if you have a, a average dis uh, transport distribution distance, um, of course, you also have always refueling stations that are a lot shorter uh, to drive and a lot longer to drive uh, to supply with hydrogen fuel. And here you see this uh, very large impact. Um, now you might uh, ask, OK, why did you uh, choose uh, Trucking as distribution option, isn't this uh, rather expensive and um, increases uh, the costs of the hydrogen fuel? And then I would say, yes, uh, that's true. And that's why we look at the next slide. Here um, we have um, done a sensitivity analysis and we have uh, reduced the trucking distance um, from the import location uh, to the refueling station by adding a um, national pipeline system. Now on the left-hand side, you see the assumptions for the base case. For the example of pipeline import from Morocco, you see on the bottom left, there is this uh, green arrow, and this is a pipeline that goes to a uh, industrial center in Germany. And from this point, you have this uh, national distribution by truck. And here we have indicated the average transport distances, which from this location to all the refueling stations in Germany would be around about 325 kilometers. And now if we move to the right-hand side, 
uh, to the right hand graphic, uh, you see those lines. That's the national distribution uh, system by pipeline. And then you have those little red triangles. And those triangles, they indicate now regional hydrogen outlets. And each of those triangles could be a regional liquefier or a uh, trailer facility for gases, hydrogen road transport. And then, of course, uh, that reduces the transport distance. And we have done the analysis. Um, if we would assume this uh, hydrogen backbone here, this green one, and that's not our uh, uh, our um, idea to, to build it like this, that's actually a, um, a concept uh, proposed by the European gas uh, transport system operators uh, last year and updated this year, and we've just uh, taken their idea and put it in, in the graphic and added those liquefiers. However, um, that reduces the transport distance from 325 kilometers to uh, 75 kilometers kilometers in that case. And that significantly reduces uh, the transport costs as um, large-scale pipeline transport is, of course, a lot uh, more cost-efficient than road trailer transport by liqu with liquids or, or gases hydrogen. And that's now only one example how you could reduce this uh, last mile road delivery. Um, you could also apply different um, means of distribution. For example, you could use uh, inland shipping of liquid hydrogen from the coast. Uh, you see on the left graphic in Germany, we only have uh, coast in the northern part. So that's where all the ships come in. And from that, you have to go all the way down to the south. But we have uh, some rivers, for example, the Rhine, and you could uh, take the hydrogen onto a river barge and bring it up the river, or you could use uh, the railway system uh, for uh, cost-efficient transport. Now, on the next slide, we see actually the impact of um, this pipeline system of this sensitivity analysis. The, the graphic on the left-hand side, that's still the same than two slides ago. But now on the right-hand side, you see those stacked bars, and that's the result for uh, the supply case with this national hydrogen backbone. And you can see that um, those two bars are reduced, and that's indicated by this black arrow. And you see, first of all, that you have a rather big decrease for the 70 megapascal fuel, and that's just due to the fact that here we have assumed uh, gases, hydrogen transport by uh, trailer with 50 megapascal, and that's rather expensive compared to liquid hydrogen transport, which is the other stack bar. And here you only have a, uh, let's say, rather a marginal cost reduction. But at the end, what happens um, is that the cost gap between those three fuels is significantly reduced. Um, in this graphic, you can still see there is some cost advantage of LH2 and CCH2 over 70 megapascal. Um, however, you see they get really close. And then you could uh, also do the analysis for, for other distribution options. But um, you see how important the choice of the last mile distribution option is if you consider the overall um, import supply chain from hydrogen production in another country, transport to Germany, distribution in Germany, and then refueling station and refueling. The distribution uh, option is really relevant for the overall fuel costs. And by applying a pipeline system, uh, you can uh, reduce those costs compared to the trailer uh, solution. Now, uh, having talked about uh, the resulting fuel costs, we can have a look at the uh, greenhouse gas emissions on the next slide, please. Uh, first of all, on this slide, I would like to mention that the greenhouse gas sh emissions shown on, um, include all emissions from the production to the nozzle and all um, CAPEX emissions as well. Uh, CAPEX emissions, some know that as gray emissions. Those are the emissions that are related with the production of the equipment. So to say the production of the photovoltaic module, the production of the, uh, the pipeline or the refueling station. So that's all included in, in, in those figures. And we see, first of all, the two bars on the left. They are more or less equal. So again, LH2 and CCH2 and 70 megapascal show the same uh, carbon footprint. 
Um, there is a marginal uh, difference again for 70 megapascal, but uh, you can barely see it in the graphic. So it's more or less the same here. And then for the pipeline import case, um, you see there is some um, some difference, and it's quite obvious where this difference comes from, and that's this uh, orange yellowish uh, section, and that's the liquefaction in Germany. And you remember, I've already mentioned that um, in this case, where we import hydrogen via pipeline, we have the liquefaction in Germany, and that's powered by grid electricity. And in 2035 in Germany, um, we still have uh, gas-powered plants on the grid and also still some, um, some uh, coal-powered plants. The coal phase-out is a few years later. So that quite heavily impacts on the, the footprint of this fuel in this case. Um, that's just due to the uh, electricity consumption of the liquefier. For the 70 megapascal option, you see a, um, yeah, a little... Uh, dark green section and a little bigger uh, light green section. And that's just uh, the electricity, again, also from, from the German grid, grid mix to power the compressor for filling the, the, the transport trailer at first, and then also for further compression at the refueling station. On the right-hand side, uh, you see it just for comparison's sake, um, what could be achieved if you would place a uh, electrolyzer right next to a refueling station in Germany, and then your carbon footprint uh, depends significantly on the choice of electricity you use. If you use grid electricity, it's a uh, very high bar. And if you would use, for example, uh, just wind power, uh, you can uh, reduce the overall uh, emissions of, of your fuel. But if you compare the, the, the national on-site production and the import supply chain, you understand um, that there is not too much of a difference between those uh, fuels. They are all can be considered low, low carbon uh, fuel supply chains. Um, and, you, and that's uh, quite, quite uh, important to understand that uh, the, the import of hydrogen does not necessarily mean that you have higher um, greenhouse gas emissions related with that. Um, we also uh, found out uh, by analyzing the data that the uh, infrastructure for hydrogen actually only has a marginal uh, impact on the uh, overall emissions here. So the production of the electrolyzer or the refueling station itself is it's not that important. It's usually the operation uh, of the refueling station or the compressor or the liquefier and the greenhouse gas emission that are um, related to the production of the photovoltaic modules, which are used to power the electrolyzer. That's the, the big blue part on the bottom. So those are the important aspects. Now, uh, let's wrap things up on the last slide, please. Um, let's have a look at the key messages. Um, number one, 2035, 1.5 megatons of hydrogen fuel demand, just for those two truck classes we considered. And this demand, uh, already justifies a nationwide comprehensive refueling network. So no matter what other vehicle classes would do, uh, battery, other forms of hydrogen fuel, just for the long haul heavy duty trucks, it would be quite feasible to establish a, a refueling station uh, network in Germany. And number two, uh, it could be around about 700 refueling stations, 750 of which uh, 350 are located at the highway system. And then more importantly, uh, number three here, by 2035, we can assure that you, it's possible to achieve fuel costs of below five euro per kilograms for all three hydrogen fuels. And here I have to mention that our assumptions regarding hydrogen production technologies, uh, that means the electrolyzer and also the renewable electricity, those assumptions are rather conservative in our study. So if you would uh, look at more um, recent cost projections uh, for electrolysis and uh, renewables, you could also here be more aggressive in terms of uh, cost reduction and then we could also uh, see even lower uh, fuel costs in Germany from imported hydrogen fuels. Or uh, if you would switch to uh, blue hydrogen, uh, that might also uh, enable uh, uh, further cost reductions, at least in the, in the medium term. Number four is also very important, and that's about the 
volatility uh, of imports and uh, fuels. Uh, what we have seen is that if you import liquid hydrogen, of course, it's quite feasible to also dispense liquid hydrogen, but it's also feasible to use liquid hydrogen imports to uh, dispense gases hydrogen. And that's something uh, which uh, some of you might already know. That's that's not too new. But also the other way around is quite quite feasible. You can have pipeline imports uh, and then have national liquefac liquefaction and then use this liqu liquefied hydrogen for uh, LH2 fuel or cryocompressed fuel. And that's something um, uh, that's really interesting to understand that uh, no matter your choice of hydrogen import, you're always free to uh, choose uh, the fuel, whatever you want. So we do not have any limits here. Number five, we have seen that uh, a national uh, distribution infrastructure uh, is required, an efficient one, to ensure uh, low hydrogen fuel costs, and that could be a, a national backbone or, as mentioned, uh, inland shipping or rail transport. And with number six, we have seen that for all the uh, fuel types, we can achieve quite uh, low greenhouse gas emissions, even though if we import the hydrogen. Now, uh, that was my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your um, attention. In case you have uh, any questions, we will have a Q&A session right now. And if you come up with additional questions later on, please uh, feel free to contact me or any of my colleagues from this uh, project consortium. Thank you very much.